All right, so next time we'll have the exam. It'll cover everything through Salesforce management. We will not cover uh, on that exam time management. And the reason I'm skipping that chapter is we're running out of time. And the truth of the matter is, is that time management is one of those things that you just sort of have to figure out which system works for you. Lots of companies now use salesforce.com, and so that is one of the things that will help you with time management in terms of scheduling and reminders and things like that. But uh, time management seems to be one of the issues that lots of students have problems with because they have a tendency, your generation, my generation, even have a tendency to procrastinate. We all put things off until the last minute. And so it's really one of those things that you just have to figure out. If Mr. Regeers, did I say that correctly? Yeah is sitting here with this calendar open. I just noticed that. I haven't seen anybody actually use a hard calendar in a long time, but studies do suggest that, that actually writing things down in a hard calendar keeps you organized and if you put it in your phone because you have a tendency to commit things more to memory if you actually write them down. So you just have to find a system that works for you, but we will cover through Salesforce management. Luckily for you, since I was gone and Dr. Gooch had to cover for me while I was at the International Fleet and Sales Competition in Orlando, two weeks ago, um, and then last week I came back after having sat on two airplane, or four airplane flights rather, one sick student on the trip to Orlando, my mother who was sick, I got it last week and so I was not here, and Dr. Gooch covered for me Thursday, th Tuesday you have the day off, so that's why we're a little bit behind. The other thing that I need to make sure that you know that we will do on Tuesday is we will draw for your dyad's position in presenting your sales presentations, your, your full sales presentation. So we'll have to figure out how many groups need to go each uh, for the days that we have remaining. And what I'm gonna do is give you an other opportunity to win bonus points by on the day that your group is supposed to present your dyad, if you will show up at 8.30 instead of 9.30 and be ready to present, you'll have the opportunity to get 15 bonus points that will be added to the third exam score um, to help you out with that in case you don't do well on that exam. And so far, I'm kind of amazed that more people didn't show up for the sales career fair that we had because a number of you have really low scores and still didn't, didn't show up. Uh, you had an opportunity to replace an entire task. So that'll give you one more opportunity for bonus points if you can show up on the day that you're supposed to present early. So we'll draw for those slots on Tuesday. If you don't like the position that you're team draws, you're going to have to try and sell your classmates to switch with you, to switch the numbers uh, of, the, of the day that you go. If you are set to go and you don't show up, because we're pressed for time, there's not much I can do in terms of rescheduling those, uh, those presentations. So it'll just be, you're out of luck, barring sort of extraordinary circumstances. So make sure that you're here for that. The other thing I wanted to mention was that there was one student in this class who showed up, participated in the speed selling competition, and he won first place in the speed sell competition. I was really, and he's not here today. It's Taylor Barnes. He sits right back there on the back row. And not only did he get 100 points for his, for his lowest exam score, plus two points for every vendor he visited, he also won the competition paid $250 for first place. So... Um, those of you who missed it, sorry, you had an opportunity to win 250 bucks. Taylor won it. I was really kind of surprised, but he did a really good. I listened to his pitch, and uh, it was really, really good. I was, I was kind of amazed, um, considering that there were people that had competed that were competing that had taken the advanced sales class. So, uh, just pointing that out. So you have these opportunities to to do these things. So we need to talk about Salesforce management. We're managing today. A lot of our sales students never want to go into management. And the reason they don't want to go into management is because generally sales managers make less in many instances than their salespeople because they don't have as big a variable compensation plan. And so a lot of salespeople never want to go into management because it starts to limit your amount. Usually there is some component of a variable compensation plan for sales managers, but it's generally smaller. For example, the company that I worked for, the American Education Corporation, we had regional sales vice presidents. 
and they had a variable comp plan that was predicated on the number or volume of sales that were that were done in their territory, but their salespeople made commissions depending on what tier they were in, up to 15% of the sale. Most of the average sale in our business, because we were starting selling learning management systems, the average sale was $250,000 or greater. So you figure that, you do the math. You don't have to sell a whole lot of those to get some pretty big commission checks. On the other hand, the sales VPs had a pretty nice base salary. They had a base salary of $120,000, but their variable comp plan was only 1% of sales in their territory. That's a big, so most of the sales people made more money than the sales managers and the sales VPs did. But some of you will want to go into management. And so we need to talk about that in managing a sales force. So important considerations. If, and there's Taylor. And you what? What's up? One. I did. The speed design competition on my line. So there's two lines, and I won my line. It was awesome. And you got a scholarship for $250. Yeah, there you awesome. go. Awesome. Just for showing up and trying. Showing up. And 100 on an exam. So anyway, managing today, important job considerations. In every <coughs> single survey of job satisfaction, most people, with the exception of salespeople, say that money is about the 15th most important thing to them. That's not true of salespeople, but job satisfaction is important even to salespeople. They are highly motivated by money, but there are things that are important to them besides money. And what are those that they want in a job? Well, they want open and honest communication with their management. Most people want some kind of work-life balance, particularly your generation. Traditionalists who are still in the workforce really lived to work. My generation and your generation don't. We don't live to work, we what? We work to live. Most of us want, so we want work-life balance and that's important. And that can be difficult in sales, particularly if you're highly motivated by money. It becomes addictive. And you just start saying things like, well, if I want to buy, if I want a bigger Cadillac Escalade or whatever, all I have to do is go sell this much more product. And so it's, but it's important to think about that. And then the nature of the work is important. So going into an industry that I think you believe in and have faith in is important. And it's important for managers to recognize that. So the meaning and value of work, what is it about work? Well, the conventional view of work from a book called Working, which was published in 1974 by Studs Terkel, begins by saying at the beginning in his preface of the book, this book being about work is by its nature about violence to the spirit as well as to the body. It's about ulcers as well as accidents, about shouting matches as well as fights, about nervous breakdowns as well as kicking the dog around. It is above all, or beneath all about daily humiliations. To survive the day is triumph enough for the walking wounded among the many, uh, the great many of us. God, that's just a list of deprivation, isn't it? I mean, it's really disparaging of work. And this is what a lot of people feel work. And I will tell you, if you have not had a bad boss in your life, you've been lucky and you will at some point. You will work for somebody who is absolutely horrible. I can tell you I did. When I was associate general counsel here, we hired a new vice president of administration and finance. And at that point in time, the office of the legal counsel was under the office of the vice president for administration and finance. We got moved under the office of the president. But when he came in, the first day, he told my boss and I that we didn't know what we were doing. He thought we were incompetent before he even met us, really, thought we were incompetent. He was here to clean house, and we would be lucky if we had a job within a year. And I looked at him and I said, with all due respect, Dr. Wooten, I've been here longer than you. I was here when you came, and I'll be here when you leave. 
and the happiest, he was the most morose, controlling, manipulative, backstabbing, stupid, incompetent, idiotic, narcissistic, ugly, vicious, idiot I've ever met in my entire life. And he wasn't even quite frankly interesting enough to make me sick. And the day I got to hand that son of a bitch his box <laughs> and tell him he was the one that was leaving was one of the happiest days of my life. The day he got walked out the door. If you haven't had a boss like that, you will. But fortunately, if you go into sales, a lot of you don't have to deal with your boss on a daily basis because you won't be you won't be there. And hopefully, you'll have enough skills that you'll be successful enough that you'll be an asset and you'll be able to move companies relatively easily. So this is the conventional view of work. I would suggest that most of us, and the reason that you're probably sitting here on a Tuesday before Thanksgiving when everybody else is going to be off, you know, we're going to be off tomorrow for the rest of the week, is that you want a job where you don't have to put up with this kind of conventional view of work, where work is a, a struggle and a toil. In Habits of the Heart, a book by Bella and all, they talk about three different types of work. There's at the bottom level is a job. And one of the things that's important is to not only think about this from if you become a manager and what kind of work environment you want to promote, but what kind of work environment as a salesperson do you want to seek out? What kind of company do you want to seek out? At the bottom level is a job. This is one in which the identity of the individual is completely divorced from the task at hand. By the way, none of this is in the textbook. So you might want to take notes because it's going to be on the text. I've never known, in, it's not a bad job anymore. It used to be a bad job to be a garbage person, a garbage collector. Charlie Sheen and Emilio Estevez, who are brothers, starred in a rather old movie now about trash men. And back in that movie, which was, I can remember a time, everybody had different trash cans, and trash men actually rode on the back of the trash truck, and they would pick up, physically pick up cans of trash and dump them in. I can tell you, I was vice mayor in the city of Guthrie, and we used to hire our own trash men until we outsourced it. And we paid about twenty-five dollars to $30,000 a year for those positions now. And it's not a bad job. I mean, some days when I have to read students' assignments, I had a student who wrote on a paper, I think I told you this before, that they wrote on an essay exam. I approached this essay eager as a squirrel in an oak forest when wham, bam, like an elephant in a circus tumbling routine, the answer came to me. And I wrote back on their paper, I leapt like a gazelle to the conclusion that you deserve an F for making me read this vapid drivel. And when I have to read things like that, I sometimes think, you know, maybe it'd be a good, good, good thing to be a, a trash collector now. It's not a bad job anymore. They don't have to stand on the back of the trash truck and actually put the trash. You know, you make about $30,000 a year and you just drive around. It's kind of, you know, they've got this arm that comes out from the truck. It gets big blue. That's what we have in Oklahoma City and Gathering now. We have these big blue canisters and it just dumps it. It's not, not a bad life. You get to drive around, you know. Be all alone, don't have to read students' essays. But I've never known, the point of this is I've never known anybody who said, I yearn to be a garbage man. I would venture to guess that most of the people who, who have those jobs, their identity is in something else that they do. You know, they're, <coughs> they are just passionate about bass fishing or their kid's softball or something else. And so the job is merely a means to an end. What most of you want is one in which there is a connection between the job and your identity. One of the first things that people will ask you when they meet you, and I tell you this not to discourage you, but because it's the truth, 
when people ask you this, this one of the, I, I never ask people this question, but one of the first questions most people ask when they meet somebody new is what do you do? They don't ask that question because they care about you. They don't. Why do they ask that question? It's an instant way of pegging where you are on the social strata. Okay. By asking, I mean, they instantly know if, if you say I'm a trash collector, they, you know, you're, you're not in the upper classes. As much as we like to pretend that we don't have a class-based society in the United States, we do. Right? Now, unlike in Western Europe, where it may be based on sort of, you know, uh, an aristocracy, like it is in Great Britain, where you have a title, and if you're the lord of so-and-so, you know, you, you, you're in the upper class. In the United States, we tend to think it's based on merit. And a big part of that is where your job is what you do and people sort of peg you on that so i think you know one of the things that keeps me from going off the deep end and becoming the trash collector even when i have to read rather vapid essays from students is that there is some panache to saying i'm a lawyer and i'm a college professor you know i mean there's people know that requires some level of education it's a pretty good job that's a career that's what most of you want is a career, a profession, to be part of a profession, like a profession of sales. And then finally, the third is a calling where it's indistinguishable between the act, what you do. Very few things are, are actually callings. I do sort of view being a lawyer as being a calling because if you're good at it, you believe that the law is something that you, uh, that you have to have sort of a love affair with to do well. And I do very much view that as a calling, but most of you want a career and you want a profession that provides you with uh, some prestige and some money. And so look for companies um, that, that have some core values and that match your core values. It's one of the reasons when I left UCO to go into the private sector, I went to work for an educational software publisher. I couldn't go to work for Philip Morris and be general counsel and sell cigarettes. That just was not going to work for me. Um, but I, I did have to have something that I believed in and, and a company that had a core set of values that I believed in. So there are two things that we can look at in terms of the value of work, instrumental value. That's things like wages, benefits, health, disability, sick leave, paid time off. But there are also psychic goods. And I think one of the things that you can get from being in professional sales is you can get a lot of psychic goods. There's a lot of satisfaction. There's a lot of self-worth. And you get to see pretty quickly the fruits of your labor in sales. That's not true in a lot of professions where it, it, it's, you know, I mean, I have a, an uncle or a cousin actually rather who is an oncologist. He's a professor of oncology at the University of Texas. He studies pancreatic cancer and there's not, you know, I mean, if you're studying pancreatic cancer, a lot of your patients die. You don't see instant results. That's not necessarily true in selling. So you can get satisfaction, self-worth achievement self-esteem, and ultimately what I think Aristotle says that we all strive for in an economic in ethics. Um, he says the good life is the eudaimonic life. And what is that generally translated as? Well, it's generally translated as happiness. And I think as a sales manager, it's important to realize this, that people are not just motivated by wages and benefits. And there are sales managers who use that, and they use that like a, you know, as, a, as a, both a carrot and a stick. Um, and they're not necessarily the best sales managers. There are other things that they have to realize. The human fulfillment model of work at the opposite end of the spectrum from Studs Terkel and his book Working about how horrible it is. The human fulfillment model of work says that people can develop their fullest potential through work. That it's through work that we build character. It provides us with a social outlet, and that's important. The people that you work with, the customers that you call on, in many instances, you'll spend more time with them than you will with your family, with your colleagues. So it's, a, it's an important social outlet for many of us. Many of us socialize. One of the things that we talk about in this era of relationship selling is that there is a friendship aspect to it in terms of building relationships, particularly if you go into business-to-business -business sales where it's long-term. 
and it can be an expression of creativity. There is a creative aspect to selling. How Taylor pitched his 90-second speed sell is creative. And we have a rubric, but fundamentally the judges, you know, have to like what you're saying. It's not just mechanistic. There is a, a, an expression of creativity there. A synthesis view, if we think of this in terms of the Hegelian dialectic, which we start out with the thesis, the conventional view of work as being something to avoid, that you just have to do as a means to an end. Then we've got the human fulfillment model, which says work is expressive, it's creative. The liberal model of work, and the one that most of us will probably be tasked with, is the synthesis model or middle, middle view, which the philosopher Norman Bowie talks about which is predicated on a series of free choices. It's a rights theory of work. That you have a right to sort of pursue jobs in a capitalistic system, to go to work and sell your labor to the person who will pay you what you want and provide you with the benefits that you need. And if you don't like it, you can go. And one of the things that I think is a good about, again, a professional sales career or in sales management is that if you do this, you have a lot of choices. You have a lot of options open to you. And so you have this sort of liberal model of a rights-based model to work, where you can take these skills that you've learned here. Michael Bloomberg just gave $1.8 billion to Johns Hopkins University. I'm sure that our foundation person here at the Johns Hopkins of the Jackrabbits, also known as UCO, is working on an equally big gift, but you know, we have yet to see it. But one of the things that you can get when you have this education, we're one of the top 10 sales programs in the nation, is that you can have these options to choose. You know, there are lots of people that want our sales students and these options to go where you want to go. So the liberal sort of synthesis model. <clears throat> so how do we apply this to contemporary sales or sales management? Well, sales managers are facilitators. They are links between both the sellers, your sales force, and the company and its customers. And they're also a link between your sales force and the management of the company. So they're a critical link in many instances. So what are the skills that you need to have? Well, in order to be a sales manager, generally most people start out as what? Sales people. But as you work your way up in management, you'll probably do less selling and you'll rely more on management ability. And as I suggested to you, a lot of sales people never want to go into management. Why is that? A lot of them like to travel and a lot of them like the commission. And when you go into management, what happens? As I suggested earlier, your commission decreases, your commission structure decreases, your base pay generally increases, but your commission structure and your ability to travel and go and, and meet people and be with customers decreases as you spend more and more time at headquarters. So management ability. So usually in, in a lot of fields, management may not have actually done what their employees do. A lot of people who work, for example, you know, at Sam's may not have really done the jobs. One of my friends just became the district manager for all of the Sam's clubs in the Oklahoma City, Lawton, and Wichita Falls. She has 12 stores that are in her. And she was brought in to the company. She didn't start out working at Sam's and work her way up. She was a manager at Winn-Dixie in the South, and they recruited her into the company. And I can tell you, um, one of the interesting things that I did when I went into the private sector was I actually went and got, as I was chief general counsel and executive vice president for this company, and we had forklifts because we had to actually fabricate a lot of stuff, and we put it on pallets when I started because we sold to a lot of prisons, and so we would have to ship out things. 
and we would palletize these these products and put them onto um, lands or lands so that they could be delivered to, uh, or they could go out to and be put on a land or a WAN. And so I got bored, and we lost our forklift driver, so I went and got certified to drive the forklift. So I'd actually go out in the warehouse and drive the forklift, and it was fun. I love it. I mean, I, I love driving forklifts. It's it's great fun. Um, for my business, I currently own a 45 foot articulating boom lift. It's great fun. We use it to put up Christmas lights and all kinds of stuff. We have four houses that are like four stories. And they're they're great fun. Um, my point is, is that my friend Kate, who became the district manager, she's never done that. Lots of people drive forklifts in Sam's. There are lots of forklifts. It's basically a warehouse. She's never driven a forklift. Has no idea how to drive a forklift. She does know something about management. And she knows something about the retail business, but she's never done a lot of the, the jobs that her employees have actually done. That's not true in sales force management. Generally, most sales managers come from the sales force and they have actually done it. So they actually know, unlike a lot of managers, one of my friends, Robert, he works for the weather service. His manager over the IT, he's an IT person in the weather service. His manager was a meteorologist who's never done IT but they just put her in charge of IT. She has to rely on them, so she's never done that. That's not true in Salesforce management. They actually have to have a selling ability usually to, to be in Salesforce management. So they actually have, unlike a lot of management, experience in what they're actually doing. The most important things that Salesforce managers do involves hiring. And your text talks about this. This part is actually in the test. The cost of hiring <coughs> wrongly. There are hard costs in terms of salary. For most of you that will go into business to business sales, for example, at Paycom, the base pay generally starts at about 30 to 50 in those jobs. So you have a good base plus commission. If you hire somebody and you spend a year with them and they don't produce their salary back, you've lost that money. Plus the benefits. Generally benefits will be about one third to 45% of an employee's annual salary. That's what you'll spend on health care, vacation, insurance, uh, you know, all of those sort of intangibles that, that employees see. You also have recruiting costs, it costs money. It's estimated that you will spend one year's salary in recruitment of executive and sales level positions. And of course, training costs. If you go to work, one of the companies that hires a lot of our students, does a lot of our internships, is Gardner. Gardner is a completely consulting business. They consult in the field of IT. They don't manufacture or produce anything. They spend two years, because their business is so unique, they spend two years training a salesperson. That's a lot of money to spend on somebody if they don't work out, so in terms of training costs. You also have soft costs, loss of opportunity. If they're not producing, you're losing opportunity as a business, right? So you're losing opportunity costs in terms of your business, and you're also losing time. So it's important, hiring is one of the biggest and most critical <coughs> things that a sales manager will do, and making sure that you hire the right people, that they are a good fit for the corporate values and things that we talked about uh, at the beginning of this section in terms of what is, what is it that you offer employees? What kind of model of work are you attempting to instill in your workforce? What are the company's core values? The most successful companies have four sets of values. In Built to Last, Jerry Farias details what makes a successful company. Companies that have been around for over 100 years that outperform the market all have four sets of values. Now, the interesting thing about that is that they don't have to, and we talked about this at the beginning of the semester when we talked about ethics, but this is how it all comes back and it integrates again. You don't necessarily have to have good values. Philip Morris has a core set of values. They're not what we would describe as good. The president and CEO of Philip Morris was described as being cold-blooded and ruthless and adamant in his belief that there was nothing immoral 
with selling people a product that they don't need. That it was about filling a market niche that people wanted. It's not just that people don't need cigarettes. It's what? That they actually do irreparable harm to you. So what kind of core values do you want to have? What kinds of opportunities, you know, and how are you going to get the sales force that fits those? If you don't have those connections and you don't have a congruency between the people that you hire and those core values, you have these lost opportunities and you're wasting your time in terms of hiring. So how do you hire the right talent? The interview process. There are two things that I think are critical here, consistency and aptitude discovery. Now, they're not the same things. Consistency is important, but if you're consistently looking for the wrong things, you know, you may be consistent, but you're poorly consistent. If you have a set of scales that constantly measures people 10 pounds heavier than they are, it's consistent, but it's what? It's wrong. It's not accurate. So you want to be consistent. So consistency is important in the hiring process, but also aptitude discovery. How do you how do you go about doing that? One of the reasons that companies come to us, and I have more companies that come to me and want our students than I have students to give them, is because they know that we've already done a lot of the work for them in terms of weeding out students that are not going to be good at sales or don't want to do sales. So they don't have to figure that out. They don't have to figure out that these people are not basically maybe going to be uh, skilled at sales. But how do you do that? How do you, well, a lot of it is through the interview process. It's also through developing programs and relationships with universities. So when you go out and you become Salesforce managers, developing relationships with those sales schools so that you can find people that have these doing internships with those people so that you minimize those risks and costs and you can be the aptitude discovery, you know, in, in a less risky environment. What are the causes of high turnover in companies? Well, there's a pressure to hire quickly. If we're not, if we don't have enough salespeople out there selling, we're not making money. A lot of companies have relied on this model. Just hire a lot of people. Lots of companies, particularly furniture companies, Mathis Brothers comes to mind. They hire lots of people, recognizing that 90% of them are not going to last a year. But it's just about getting coverage and, you know, getting them out there and, and making enough sales. Compensation confusion. Sales compensation can often be confusing. The process of getting commissions can be confusing. How that's figured, how you're paid, you know, whether it's monthly, quarterly, yearly, things like that. You have broken or internal processes <clears throat> that lead to problem. And then a lack of fit between the candidates and the culture of the organization itself. There can be problems and causes of high turnover. So what are the characteristics of great sales managers? Great sales managers are often what we call, there are different types of leadership that we talk about if you take courses in leadership. Is leadership something that can be learned or is it born? You think it's both? It's both nature and nurture. It's kind of like salesmanship. Is salesmanship something that, you know, if you really are, the, if, you, if you have agoraphobia, I mean, the textbook tells you that anybody can learn to sell. I'm not sure that's true. If you're one of these people who has extreme social anxiety, I'm not sure I can help you. But for a lot of people, we can definitely develop the skills. So what kinds of leaders are there? In many organizations, there's sort of a formal power structure, right? 
So there's leadership that is that comes along with position. I have one of my colleagues in political science. He's one of the funniest people I know. But he'll tell you he just doesn't. He's a political scientist, so you think that political science they would want to be leaders. They study power dynamics and politics. And he'll just tell you he does not want to lead anything. He doesn't want to manage anybody. He doesn't want to lead. He hates it. He teaches statistics and political science. He teaches the methods courses. So he even teaches the courses that most students just cringe at having to take. How many of you have taken business statistics? A lot of you. How many of you just loved it? You just yearn to go back to that class. As you're falling asleep here on a Tuesday and not listening to me and wishing, you know, thinking about it's going to be Thanksgiving and you're going to have your trip to fan coma at 2 p.m. on Thursday afternoon and isn't that great? And you've got visions of sugar plums dancing in your head and cranberry sauce and gravy and stuffing and mashed potatoes and pie, in the words of Aaron Cartman. <laughs> <laughs> At least be grateful you're not in the statistics course right now. And at least I'm not drowning on about lowercase sigma equals the square root of uppercase sigma x i minus the mu squared over m, which is the formula for standard deviation, right? At least I'm not talking. To, well, I am talking about that, but I'm not making you. I'm not making you perform the functions of calculating standard deviations. This friend of mine, he he does not want to, and he teaches stats, and he doesn't like to be a leader. But in some sense, whether or not you like it, by virtue of the fact that you're a professor, you're going to have to lead. You're forced into it, even though he doesn't like being a leader. You know. He's kind of a pushover as a professor because when students become aggressive with him, he just gives them a break. You know? But you have to, you have to be a leader. There's formal leadership, this formal structure power. So I have some power in this classroom, not a lot, but some. And I have some leadership responsibilities. So there's formal leadership. Leaders that are, are leaders by virtue of the fact that they have this position. By virtue of the fact that I'm your professor, I'm at least the leader of this little group, this little tribe here in this classroom until the end of the semester. You have to sort of follow my rules. But that's not the most effective necessarily kinds of leadership. Many types of leadership are informal power structures. So what kinds of leaders can you have? You can have transactional leaders. What's a transactional leader? These are ones who just view their leadership role in terms of rewards and punishments. And a lot of sales management, a lot of older sales management focused on that. I'm the sales manager. I set your quota. You meet the goals. I give you the commission. You don't meet the goals. The reward is withheld or you're fired. Transactional leadership. What other types of leaders are there besides transactional? There's charismatic leaders. Now, charismatic leaders are generally thought of in, it can be a pejorative term. Why is that? What are charismatic leaders oftentimes? Who do we think of as being a charismatic? What's a stereotypical example of a charismatic leader? Some of the ones that they've listed in leadership books are people like Hitler. He's, you know, I mean, you look at his videos now, and by modern standards, he seems rather puppet-like, although it seems to be working for Donald Trump. 
He, he mimics a lot of the same things that Hitler did. He has big crowds, loves to have big crowds, loves to call the press. What did Hitler call the press? By the way, what did Stalin call the press, the free press? The enemy of the people. Yeah, I mean, those are, those are rather frightening. That's charismatic leadership. People who meet Donald Trump say he is charismatic. He can be charming in person. It's not necessarily great. Why is that? Well, charismatic leadership can be manipulative, but it is a form of leadership. And people are oftentimes drawn to charismatic people. So transactional leadership, formal position, power leadership, charismatic leadership, what other kinds of leadership do we have? There's one that's become popular to talk about in leadership books now called servant leadership. I'm not a big fan of that model of leadership. Although a lot of people say that sales and sales management, um, if you focus on a servant leadership, can be successful at it. You can also have transform transformational leadership. And transformational leadership and charismatic leadership can be very similar because a lot of transformational leaders are very charismatic or they're very personable, but they also want what's best. It is inseparable. Charismatic leadership can be separated from ethics. A transformational leader is not. They don't view it as being a separation from leadership. And a good sales manager, many of them are very transformational. They provide this sense of mission for their salespeople. They challenge their team members. They provide stretch goals, but they don't provide unrealistic goals necessarily. But they provide stretch goals that are realistic and attainable. What's a good goal? Again, we should, we've talked about this before. What is a good goal? Specific. It's measurable. And it's what? It's attainable. Right? So they challenge team members. They have these good goals. They give immediate feedback. They don't wait. They reward individual and team performance. And they engage in employee development, continual employee development. They're constantly providing you with opportunities to learn more about sales, about how to be a better salesperson. So they engage in employee development. Those are characteristics of great sales managers. Any questions? Okay, so again, we'll have the next exam uh, when we come back from Thanksgiving. We will draw four positions of your dyadic teams for presentations. You have the opportunity to, on the day that you present, earn bonus points. You'll be here at 8.30 and be ready to present so that we can ensure that we get through all of the presentations that we have to have since I'm cutting out one day of sales presentations by virtue of the fact that we're behind and I was sick and we didn't get all, through all the material that I need to go for the exam. So we were supposed to have the exam today and start sales presentations when next Tuesday. We'll have to delay it. So you have an opportunity to win bonus points. So be sure and know what day you're presenting. Be sure and get here at 830 so that you can be on, so that you can get bonus points and that you can be ready on Thursday. Do what? Yes. The group of two. The diet. Whatever you're still presenting. All right? No, we're drawing. Have a happy Thanksgiving. Don't eat too much turkey. Don't watch too much football. Is there any such thing as too much turkey and too much football? No. Too much turkey, but not too much football? Not, not enough ham. Not enough ham. Ooh. <laughs>